Welcome to the Chess Angle. This is not your typical chess podcast. If you're an amateur or club level player, the Chess Angle is for you. Our content is aimed at busy adults who are serious about the game but have limited study time. Featured guests include both amateur and titled players alike. And now, here's your host, director of the Long Island Chess Club, Neil Bellon. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. This is my first game analysis episode in quite a while. What I usually do is just kind of go very off the cuff. I kind of freestyle it. And what I do is discuss one of my games thematically, not really move by move from beginning to end. And I use the game as a springboard for other related chess topics that I feel are of interest for amateur players. So the discussion stems from the game and I go on different tangents and sidebars, but in a good way. When I say tangents and sidebars, you know, related to the game and chess topics. So for this game, my opponent's rating was about 1680, but he's definitely underrated. I think he's at least 100 points higher. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Now, the previous week, the week before I played him, he beat a 2200 master. And so I'm essentially facing him the next round, right? So he's he's coming in hot. As a side note, he won that game against the master by creating a wild, messy position right out of the opening. And his opponent actually lost on time. And that is the main suggested method of beating a much higher rated player to get him or her off book where they have to think for themselves from the get go. Now, there's that famous quote by Tal you must take your opponent into a deep, dark forest where two plus two equals five, and the path leading out is only wide enough for one. So, what Tal's basically saying is you really got to mix things up and confuse your opponent. And there's a better chance I'll make a mistake that way. Now, speaking of playing higher rated opponents, that's going to be an upcoming episode this season. I did one on beating lower rated opponents. And a few people said that they would love to see the opposite of that, like how to beat higher rated players. I'm going to talk about that. The main suggested method, again, is to kind of really mix things up and make it a wild game. That's what gives you a fighting chance. But as I'm going to explain in this episode about higher rated opponents, I think there are some other ways you could do it as well, because that method might not work for everybody. So that'll be coming up. At any rate, I knew this going in. I know that he's one of these players who likes to really throw down and go for the kill from move one. So I was expecting this, or at a minimum, I was expecting him to go off book early. Now, speaking of rating, which we do talk a lot about here, you may say, well, if he's really 1800, you know, why isn't that his rating? Like, why do we say that about people? Oh, he's really this or he's really that. If that were true, then that would be the person's rating, right? So if he were really about 1800, like I'm saying, why is it listed as like 1680? And it reminds me of what Bill Parcells said, right? Who's the coach of the New York Jets football team here in the States. I've been a Jets fan for years. I'm a sufferer. But anyway, Parcells used to say, you are what your record says you are. Right. He didn't like this whole argument. Well, I'm in a tough division or we had an injury or this, that. You know, if you're 0 and 5, you're 0 and 5. It's what it is. If you're, you know, 6 and 0, you're 6 and 0. But in chess, your playing strength is only a part of what your rating represents, in my view. It really represents your tournament results and your tournament performance. And I know with my opponent and many players, I go through this myself sometimes. It's a consistency thing. We'll be an 1800 or 1900 player. Let's say you're rated like 1600. You'll beat an 1800, 1900 players, maybe even 2000, but then you'll lose or draw to a 1400 or a 1300. And that absolutely crushes your rating. It basically ruins all the good work you had from beating those higher rated opponents. So you could be strong, but if you're falling victim to an upset like that, say once every five or six games, if it's a consistency thing, that can be enough to hold you back. I remember there was a player at the Queen's Chess Club where I used to play many years ago who had a phenomenal tournament one time. He beat like a 1900, then he beat like a 2100 and a 2000, and his rating was like 1620. And somebody said to him after he beat the 2100, I don't understand why your rating's so low. And without blinking an eye, he said, 
I lose too many games to lower rated players. And that's a perfect example. You know, he's like crushing players with a two in front of their rating, you know, 2000, 2100, but then he'll lose to like a 1400. And that's why he's not able to get his rating higher. Because like I said, that's all it takes. If you have a stinker of game like that, like once every five games or six games, let's say like 20% of the time, that's enough to hold you back. Now, in addition, you also have people who are very strong, very competent chess players, but they crack under tournament conditions. They're just not good with tournaments. It could be something with nerves or just touch move, using a clock, you know, having people watching. Maybe you have an opponent who has some annoying or distracting behavior. There's just something about them, you know, because some opponents, I mean, let, let's keep it real. There's just, maybe it's just me. There's something about just the way they move the pieces or the way they handle themselves. Like, it's just, I don't know. It's like an idiosyncrasy that sort of irritates you. Not all the time, but occasionally it happens. Or maybe they're intimidating in some way. Or you find them intimidating in some way. Some people can't handle that or they simply dislike the tournament environment and that affects their results. So let's talk about the game now. It was a French defense, which is normally E4, E6, D4, D5. We know that. If you're interested in the main lines of the French, you might want to check out episode 36, which I did. I devoted an entire podcast to the French defense. So in this game... I was black, so he played e4, and I played e6, of course. And again, traditionally, it's e4, e6, d4, d5. However, after the first move, e4, e6, he played c4, which is the Steiner variation. And the idea is that white's trying to get a grip on d5. But the problem with the Steiner variation, it's playable, but there's a bit of a hole for white on d4, right? Because he advanced e4 and c4, the d4 square is now very weak. And I probably should have played to control that a little more than I did. I'll explain what happened, but that's the Steiner variation. And a couple of things about the French in general, after e4, e6, white doesn't always have to play d4. And and now again, that's probably the best move. It is the best move because you're controlling the center, you're getting your center pawns in. But there are other moves that I see all the time at the amateur and club level and online that are perfectly playable. For example, after e4, e6, white can play knight c3. White could even do something like d3. Like there's a lot of choices and I see that all the time. But anyway, after e4, e6, he did c4, which again is the Steiner variation. Now, I probably here should have played either d5 or c5 because d5 plays in the center, and c5 also hits in the center, but it covers the weak d4 square. I could have even gone e5 again, which seems ridiculous because my first two moves would have been e6 and then e5, right? Moving the same pawn twice. But when your opponent plays unconventionally, you can sometimes do that, right? That's why you got to be careful with these rules. Like, you know, don't move the same piece twice in the opening. You got to look at that more as a guideline than a hard and fast rule, okay? So after e4, e6, c4, e5 is perfectly playable by black. The other thing is that when your opponent plays a move that's not really a book move, you can sometimes still play what you normally would have. So in other words, after e4, e6, c4, I could still play d5 here. In fact, the engine likes that best. So sometimes you can do that. Sometimes even if one of the moves is not what it normally is, you can still carry out the way you normally would. And D5 works here. It hits in the center. I probably should have played that or C5, like I said, but I played B6. And what I do often, I use the Queen's Indian or the Nimzo or like a Hedgehog type setup. It's like a little bit of a hybrid. Like it's sort of like a Queen's Indian, Nimzo, Hedgehog-ish like hybrid And it works very well against a lot of systems white plays or a lot of unconventional openings that white plays that are a little bit off book. And what the hedgehog basically is, the hedgehog is a structure where you usually have your center pawns on E6 and D6. You have your queen side pawns on A6 and B6. And your bishops are where they normally are in a queen's Indian defense, right? On E7 
and b7, the light squared bishops, fee, and kettoed. In this game, I ended up doing more of like a Nimzo type thing. But but anyway, you know, that was my thinking. All right. I, I didn't want to overplan because I wasn't sure what he was going to do. But after e4, e6, c4, b6, my thinking was I'm going to put my light squared bishop on b7. My dark squared bishop is either going to go to e7 or maybe bishop b4 like a Nimzo. My knight might go to e7 or f6. Depends on what he does with it. You know, you got to you gotta be flexible. It's, it's a little early for me to have like 20 move plans, but at least I had an idea of what I wanted to achieve structurally, but I had to see what he was going to do. Now, speaking of French defense ideas, another thing I see a lot of is what's called the Schlechter variation. That's where after e4, e6, d4, d5, which is normal, white plays bishop d3 on move three. Instead of the advanced variation, the exchange of the main line, white plays bishop d3. So e4, e6, d4, d5, bishop d3, right? Protecting e4. I see that a lot online, not at the club too much, but if you play the French defense online, if you're doing like five minute blitz games, you see that a lot and it's playable. It's not really a main line. It's not something GMs really do to my knowledge, but it's playable. So I just kind of wanted to go over some of these unconventional French defense ideas by white that are playable. It might not play for an advantage the way some of the traditional lines will, but at the amateur level especially, they're perfectly playable lines. So my point is what I try to do against unconventional openings is I try to steer it or transpose it into an opening that I do know. Now, it doesn't always work out that way, but I try to do that and at least get a position where I'm somewhat comfortable and I have an idea of what I need to do. So we have e4, e6, c4, b6. He did knight c3, and then I did go bishop b4. I was debating going bishop e7, but I decided to do like a Nimzo type thing and attack the knight on c3. And usually with a Nimzo, once you go bishop b4 with a dark squared bishop, usually you're going to trade it for the knight. And the idea is that you're then gaining a tempo for development. So you're giving up the bishop for the knight, but you have smooth development, which is always good, especially, you know, for black, you want to catch up, you're move behind. I mean, don't get too caught up in the whole like white moves first thing, but that's the traditional thinking. You know, you trade the dark squared bishop for the knight because if he hits it with like a three and you move it back, you're essentially losing a tempo and allowing white to build up center. So I moved it to b4, bishop b4, knowing I was probably going to chop on c3. So we're moving along here. And just a couple of things about what's happening thematically. So I did trade on c3. So he has doubled pawns on c4 and c3. And then I played h6. Now, even if you're not seeing the position in your head, which I don't expect you to, as a general rule, h6 is often a good idea in the French because you're keeping white's pieces off of g5, which can be very annoying because white can sometimes get a nasty kingside attack. So if he can get a knight on g5 or a bishop there, it can, it can be very annoying, right? And with knights, you kind of want to take away squares. He had two pieces aiming at g5, so just a very useful move. And I didn't castle yet, okay? Neither did he. We're still kind of developing. And then he moved his queen out to d4 like right away, probably a little premature, but um, it, it actually works here. And the idea is that he's hitting the weak g7 square because I didn't castle yet and my knight's undeveloped. So it's actually a pretty good move. Maybe premature, but as I'm thinking about it, it's probably playable. And then I challenge queens. He pushes his e4, e, e pawn, excuse me, forward to e5. I move the queen back and then he develops his bishop. I fee and shadow my light squared bishop and the a8 h1 diagonal is looking real good right now. So my bishop is nice there. And, you know, we're developing. I hit his queen with my knight. That's kind of what I was saying earlier about maybe it was a little premature for him. And then I castled queenside. Now let's talk about queenside castling for a minute. It's not something I generally do, very un like But if the position calls for it, I'll do it. And here it works because there's nothing between my king and rook. But again, you don't want to castle just because you can. But what happens is... My d7 pawn is weak. He has a he has you know a semi-open file hitting it, and he's going to probably double on the file. So by castling, my rook 
is now on the same file as his queen. And it puts my king in safety. And if he castles kingside and we have an opposite side castling situation, that's actually a mistake for him because I'm going to be able to play g5, pawn to g5 and get the jump on the attack. So I castled queenside. Computer likes it here. And it was the right move. As I said, I was expecting or I was wondering really if he was going to castle kingside. But like I said, I would have gotten the jump on him. And I think he saw that. I could tell he wanted to. He thought here for a while. Like he's usually a fast player. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. He usually moves pretty quickly. But when I castled queenside, he thought for a while. And I could tell he was itching to castle in the opposite direction and kind of you know, start a real violent battle, but he saw that it didn't work. So I give him credit for that. He actually castled queenside as well, which, I mean, it's not that uncommon. You don't see it all the time, but that's not usually how my games go, where both sides castle queenside. So very odd structure right now. Very unconventional opening. Computer has it as completely equal because pretty much everything's protected. There's no real weaknesses. Something just about queenside castling in general not so much in this position, because like I have a cat, I'm castled queenside with the light square bishop fee and keto there. So my king side's looking good. But normally, the issue when you castle queenside is you have to be careful that the diagonal to the king is sometimes vul vulnerable to checks. And the a2 square or the a7 square for black is often vulnerable as well. So you usually as a tightening up move, you want to move your king over like, like king to b one or king to b eight. That's usually something you may need to take a tempo to do. Whereas with king side castling, the king is already covering the corner square. So just something to keep in mind when you castle queen side, you got to watch out depending on the pawn structure about checks along the, the diagonal to the king, if it's open and then, like I said, the king may need to shift over a square just to cover the corner. So something to be in mind. So this is an interesting structure with both sides castled queenside. Now, traditionally, usually queenside castling when one player castles queenside and the other player castles kingside. In other words, opposite side castling. And if the queens are still on the board, that's usually a race. That usually ends up being a very violent struggle both sides do pawn storms towards the king, and it's often a race who can break through first. All right, and that's normally with opposite side castling, you really have to play, I don't want to say aggressively, but if you're, you're too passive, you can get crushed. Really depends on the position and the pawn structure, but usually each side tries to race to attack the opponent's king. And as I said, if he had castled king side here, it would have been a mistake because as I said, I would have played g5, hitting his bishop, and I probably would have won the race. Not easy by any means, but he saw that, and that's why he castled queenside as well. Now, just as a side note here, let's just kind of go away from the game for a minute, talk about something related. There's this idea of quote-unquote prepping for an opponent. Now, obviously, at the top levels, you have to do that. You really don't have a choice because of all the theory out there. And when you're playing at that level, you simply can't wing it. But I really wonder whether quote unquote prepping for an opponent is really necessary at the amateur level. I mean, or at least prepping for a long time against an opponent might be a waste of time. I mean, if you want to prep a little bit, oh, I might try this opening of this variation, fine. But to spend, let's say, a you know, couple hours or several hours prepping for an opponent at this level, I'm not so sure it's necessary for a number of reasons. First of all, your opponent normally is not going to play the way you want him to or expect him to as far as specific moves. And the other problem with prepping is that you, you still need to play chess. You know, I spoke with this about, uh, with this rather, with Brian Karen when he was on the podcast. You know, people think if you prep for an opponent that, you know, you don't have to do any work at the board. You know, you still need to play chess. And prepping for an opponent is not going to cover every situation. It's really just maybe the kind of opening you want to do, that type of thing. But very often, amateur games go in so many different directions. I just wonder if that's even worth it or if it's if it's silly. I don't know. Just I'm not really big on prepping for opponents because 
when I tried to do it, as I said, the game always goes in a different direction. And then what happens is if you spend time prepping, you're going to try to force that prep when the position in front of you actually doesn't call for it. And you're going to try to force something that doesn't work and that can cause you to blunder. Whereas if you don't prep, you'll be a little bit more flexible. Flexibility is very important in this game, especially at the amateur level. Because let's face it, they never really play the way that you expect as far as book lines. Now, another thing with this player, he's also a very fast player. Plays his moves very quickly, and that can be very frustrating. And you have to not let that get into your head because usually when players move quickly like that, move after move, they generally will make a mistake at some point. And this actually did happen later on. See, what happens is they essentially make one quick move too many. Most amateurs cannot sustain that whole move fast but accurately type of technique where they try to like, you know, wear you down on the clock. In other words, this was a game 90 with a 10 second delay, which is pretty slow. But you'll have opponents who play it like it's a 5-0 blitz game. And what they do is they try to mess with your head. It's a style some have because you're sitting there thinking, looking for the best move. And when they play quickly and the moves are accurate, you know, it can be very frustrating. Like when they're playing really fast and they're right there in the game, it can be very frustrating. I'm thinking of a player we used to have, uh, Norman. Shout out to Norman. I haven't spoken to him in a while, but he would do this amazingly well. He would, he was a Long Island player. I'm not sure if he's still on the scene. I haven't seen him at the club, but he would play so fast, but he would be right there in the game. And he won so many games because of that, because it would, it would just drive guys crazy. You know, it would be a slow time control. He was making his moves in, you know, seconds each, like it was a blitz game and he would be right there in the game. But when you face an opponent like that in a slow time control, just play like you normally would, because usually eventually they are going to slip up. You just got to wait them out. But I realize that it also can be very frustrating to face a player like that, but don't let it get to you. So at any rate, I castled queenside because it moved my king to safety and I was facing his queen. I can now maybe look for a D, a D pawn, uh, rather push in some cases. And, you know, his king was a little bit vulnerable because the H6 c1 diagonal to his king was open i can't do anything with it now but you know these are just ideas i'm thinking about when you look at these positions you kind of need to understand what's happening what the plans are at least as best you can and he had those doubled pawns on the c file so his c4 pawn is weak he can't push it right now and my knight my g8 knight hasn't developed yet so i need to do that right now i have no squares because my queen is on e7 and he has his pawn advanced on e5. Okay, so my thinking here was if I could somehow take advantage of the c4 pawn, develop my knight, maybe somehow get in a d pawn push. If I could somehow get in d6 or d5, doesn't seem to work right now. But, you know, these are just some ideas. So what I did was I actually pushed g5 attacking his bishop, which was protecting e5. And then he moves his bishop back. And so I'm looking to attack on the queen side now because that's kind of where I have some space, right? These are some other ideas. So we're playing for a while and I felt I had an initiative on the queen side. It turns out, according to the engine, that it's pretty much equal. But I was happy with how I was playing. I was expanding on the queen side. I was trying to weaken some of his pawns. Then we get to a very critical and instructive moment. So it's late in the game, it's late at night, and it turns out he's a little bit better here. And what happens is he has his queen and rook as a battery on the D file. He has his queen on D3 and his rook on D1. My king is on C8 and he has a pawn on D5. So he was threatening a breakthrough on the D file. Like if he goes D takes E6, I have to be careful because if I go D takes E6, he can penetrate into my king. So he has some potential pressure on D7, okay, and towards my king. Whereas my queen, rook, and knight weren't really doing much. He also had a bishop on G5 that was locked in with a pawn. 
that was hitting D8. So he's definitely better. Not like winning, but he's positionally better, and I knew that. And I really had to think here. And so I was maneuvering my knight. Now, it turns out, see, sometimes it's funny how you miss a simple move. Because you're thinking like, you know, you, I want to be careful about moving my king because the queens are on the board. All I had to do here, and it's funny, in the post-mortem I saw this. So I'm wondering if I thought a little longer in the game if I would have seen it. All I had to do was move my king to b7, just kind of tuck it out of the way. You know, maybe I would have seen it. But I ended up doing something else, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But he was trying to break through on the d file. My king is on c8. So if I simply tucked it into b7 and I have a pawn on c7 that protects it, I would have been okay. But then I was worried he was then going to push with c5. I was kind of seeing ghosts. So tucking my king to the side is all I really needed to do. I moved my knight back instead, which the computer said is okay. And then I offered a queen trade because my knight was blocking my queen. And if he takes my queen, it connects my pawns. And he did not take my queen. I didn't expect him to. I'm trying to just maneuver. My pieces were kind of shuffling. It was one of those positions where I was defending, he was trying to break through, but neither side could make progress. I think both of us were not quite sure how to play it. So there was a little bit of shuffling here. I'm just kind of hoping he was going to make a mistake. And then that's what ended up happening. And this leads to something very instructive, which is blind spots or what they call hallucinating when you analyze. So here's what was going on. I could tell, I could tell that he was looking for some type of tactical breakthrough on the D file. He wanted to move the pawn in front of his queen and somehow meet with his queen and rook, right? Because my king was on C8. And I could tell he's looking at these different ideas. His bishop is right there. So his pieces are attacking me. Now, it's funny, during the game, I thought at this point that th there might be an actual chance I could lose. Like here, I was starting to get worried. Of course, the computer says it's completely equal, but you got to remember what the computer says and what you believe and what you can do are two different things. All right. The computer might say it's equal because there's a simple solution, but if you don't see that solution, right, it doesn't matter. So it's just funny looking at it now. It's amazing how, you know, different our assessment often is. But anyway, I played knight f5 attacking his queen on d4. And all he had to do here was simply move his queen back to d3. He moves it to safety and it's still on the same file as his rook, and he still has the threat. Remember what I said a few episodes ago? When you have a piece that's being attacked, right, especially your queen, but any piece that's being attacked, very often just move it to safety, right? Sure, look for tactics, look for those fancy moves and all those like, you know, the types of moves you see with the puzzles and in the books. You know, look to see if there's a shot, but if there isn't, and probably 80% of the time there isn't going to be one, just move it to safety. So all he had to do was move his queen back. And I would have really had to sit there and think, hopefully I would have seen queen b7 at that point. But all he had to do was move it. And instead, he went d takes e6, double question mark. And then I'm looking at this. I'm like, did I miss something? He blundered his queen. I ended up taking his queen. Knight takes d4, right? His move, after I played knight f5, attacking his queen on d4, when he played d takes e6, that's a double question mark, game losing blunder. This is what he failed to see. After I go knight takes queen, what he thought he had was he could go e takes d7 check. And then when I move my king, he takes my rook and wins a rook and, and gets a queen. He thought it was a winning tactic. What he failed to see is when my knight takes his queen, it blocks the file. So when he does the pawn fork check, it's not protected. So my king can simply take it. That's what a blind spot is. You look at the variations of a move sequence or you think you see a tactic, like he plays this and I do this. But what you don't realize is that, okay, when he plays this, I'm not able to do that. So what he missed, what the blind spot was, is that when I go knight takes queen on d4, it blocks the rook on d1. There's no check. So when he did e takes d7 check, I simply took with the king and then he takes rook, you know, he did rook takes d4, rook takes the knight check and I have a queen and a rook for a bishop and a rook. He lost his queen. So 
rook takes d4 check, I move my king to c6, and it's over. He ended up resigning two moves later. You know, he even said after the game, he goes, oh, you know, I messed up. He goes, I didn't realize that after you take my queen, it blocks the file like, like the pawn's not protected. Because he thought he had this like pawn. It was one of those pawn fork tactics where the pawn checks the king and also attacks the rook. But the pawn has to be protected for it to work. And my knight blocked the file. So this very strong player who beat a 2200 player the week before ended up hanging his queen because he misread this tactic. There was a blind spot. It happens. And I'm, I'm not saying that to, to bust chops or to criticize. He's a strong player. We've all been there. And this is an example of how blind spots happen. In your analysis, you don't realize that the opponent's previous move doesn't allow you to do what you want. Like you say, oh, he does this, then I can do this. But wait, when he does this, I don't have that anymore. It happens. It's hard to see these things sometime, sometimes, uh, excuse me. And, you know, I went on to win the game. Little bit of luck there. That's an example of luck in chess because I felt he was much better. You know, looking back now, I don't know if I would have seen that King B7 move that I had to move my king to safety. I mean, obviously looking at it now, it's so obvious, but there's no ego here. I might not have seen that during the game. And when I attacked his queen, if he had simply moved it to safety, right? This was an example like like doubt, don't analyze unnecessary tactics, kind of like I mentioned in the last game. Well, I mean, not so much really. I guess he thought he had it. But when I played knight f5 attacking his queen, if he had simply shuffled his queen back, I now have to really sit and think of what to do. But this happens all the time in amateur games where you have these blind spots and all it takes is one thing to miss and that's it. And in this case, he lost his queen. All right. But, you know, very, very strong player. I uh, got a little bit lucky there. And, you know, he had that initiative uh, at the end that that might have been winning. Like I said, the computer said that it was even. But, you know, for me as the player sweating it out. You know, I was a little, little uh, uncomfortable there because I think his pieces were definitely better than mine. So just to recap, there were some things about the French defense and the many ways white can play out of the opening. I spoke about using kind of a hedgehog formation or Nimzo and Queens hedgehog sort of hybrid as kind of a universal defense to a lot of things. But especially if white plays something that is unconventional that you're not sure of, that whole hedgehog type thing can work very, very well. I ended up in sort of a Nimzo hedgehog hybrid, but then ended up castling queenside only because that's what the position called for. And so that's another thing we learned about is flexibility. I would never normally have castled queenside in that structure, but the way it turned out is that queenside castling was the best move. All right, and we talked about dealing with players who play really quickly just try to wait them out and don't let it get to you. And then the most important thing, probably the most instructive moment in this game, and we've all been there, is the blind spots when analyzing. So he thought after I take his queen that he had this pawn tactic that would win the queen back and gain a rook. But again, he missed that after I took his queen that his rook didn't protect the pawn when it checked the king so I could simply take it happens all the time where it all comes down to a blunder and as such is life at the club level. So I hope this was instructive. I enjoyed sharing this game with you. I kind of like these game analysis episodes just because I think it's practical to actually look at a game. And, you know, selfishly for me, it's, it's enjoyable just because I kind of kind of like to go over it. But I hope you got something out of it. We really appreciate you listening. And as always, I hope you win your next game. Have a great day, everybody.